it's very difficult to make fans for the team that is losing. Yes. Morale was low Saturday night. Very deeply connected to that Eskimo name. Mm. Diversity, equity, mm -hmm. inclusion, mm -hmm. um, ESG initiatives. Mm -hmm. Well, what company changed their name? Like, imagine mm -hmm. the discussion that has to go around mm -hmm. that. Somebody said, come on, Victor, I will become a fan again if you guys get some backbone and switch back to the Eskimos name. Now, I I'm opinionated. I'm not going to give you a fence or politically correct answer on this. And my job is to bring you back. Yes. Like, what, are, what are you doing to, to really go there and extend that invitation back? Welcome back to another episode of the Rhino Show Podcast. This is the number one black hosted podcast here in Canada, global top 1% powered by Holtz Media. Listen, we have a special guest here in the building, Victor Kui. As you can say, see, we are literally standing here, Commonwealth Stadium. I remember I sat over in that little chair over there as a kid. Monumental moment. This gentleman, uh, we're going to call him a renaissance, man. 17 years in Asia, builds one of the biggest MMA uh, fight card championship leagues out there, then trails back to Edmonton as president and CEO. Victor, welcome to the show. It's awesome to be here. Thank you very much. Sports is about, it's about the heart. Mm. And if I don't touch your heart, mm. you don't decide to buy a ticket mm. and, and support the mm. team. So how do... How do sport properties do that? Well, they do that by superstars and players and coaches and the atmosphere and the experience. Mm. And all of those kind of things represent the brand. Mm. So when you make a change to that, it is a bit like breaking up with somebody. You <laughs> Absolutely. Know? You're like, you believe mm. you're breaking up because it's to a new future. <laughs> yes. Right? You're obviously making a change because you want to move forward. But you're nostalgic. And you yes. remember yes. all the good times. And the bad times start to slowly you know, drip away. So here we have is a great history of mm. the Edmonton Eskimos. Mm. And I love the team and I love the name. Mm. My first scholarship for university was from the Edmonton Eskimos. Mm. Like it was wow. because of that, wow. I was able to afford to go to university. Yes. I mean, my parents were immigrants, typical yeah. immigrant story, right? Mm. Moved here from the Philippines with no money. And, and so to get a scholarship to go to university is it like changed my life. Huge. Right. Huge. And so I'm very deeply connected to that Eskimo name. Mm. But let's fast forward to the future that we want to build for our children. Mm. You know, you have two young children. Yes. You're a young father. I'm mm. a father. I've got two kids. Mm. What is the world that we want to look like? Mm. Well, I know growing up in Edmonton, there was words that I was allowed to use mm. in the 80s, mm. in the 90s, that are no longer appropriate to use today. 100%. Now, I didn't use a lot of those words, you know, Many times I didn't use it with ill intent. Mm -hmm. It was part of my normal vernacular. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Everybody used yeah, it. Whether yeah. you're talking about a table or yeah. a dinner or whatever, yeah. like you just threw up different words. Yeah. But as the world changed and we try to make a better world, mm. we've said some of these words are not appropriate because mm. they elicit an emotion from the heart mm. and they mean something different in a broader context. Mm. So how can you be a part of making that change? Mm. Well, one of those things was a change of the Eskimo name. Does everybody love it? Do some people love it? Do some people hate it? Do some people think it's racist or not racist? Mm. All that, okay, I get it, mm. right? But the Elks change and where we're going forward with the brand mm. was one of the bravest decisions this Huge. organization Huge. ever made. Huge. Because they could have not done it. Mm. They really could have. Everyone talks about mm. diversity, equity, mm -hmm. inclusion, mm -hmm. um, ESG initiatives. Mm -hmm. Well, what company changed their name? Like, imagine mm. the discussion that has to go around mm. that. It's, it, it, was, it was not a spur of the moment thing. Mm. And I believe it makes our organization better mm. and stronger and builds the kind of team mm. that the city can rally around for the next generation. Well, you know, I kind of like your stance on it because I, I feel like, you know, the Elks, I mean, Eskimos moving into the Elks, you guys said uh, we're, we're actually going to get off the fence and make a clear decision. Now, there was one comment on your guys' YouTube channel where somebody said, come on, Victor, I will become a fan again if you guys get some backbone and switch back to the Eskimos name. Now, I, I'm opinionated. I'm not going to give you a fence or politically correct answer on this. My thing was, I think it takes more backbone to get off the fence and make a stand. What do you think of that? Uh, absolutely. And that's why I say that the name change was the bravest thing this organization has ever done mm. in, its, in its history. Like it was a massive change, not only financially, but mm. from the community and trying to roll this out. So 
I, I get it that we have fans that are still connected to the Eskimos, mm. and that's why we talk about the Eskimo history. Mm. I don't say it like it's something we have to bury. Mm. That is a part of our huge, team. It's what huge. makes a beautiful stadium and, yes. and our 14 great cups, right? But how do we build where we want to go forward? Mm. And today, where we are is we need the community to understand <laughs> we're building something for, for the next generation, yes. right? Yes. So we've got this transition period that we've got to go through mm. and make sure that the people that don't feel connected to the new name, mm. we it's our job to give them a reason to mm. feel connected to the new name, mm. right? Mm. And now, I'll just talk about the elephant in the room. We're 0-5. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. on one hand... It's very difficult to make fans with a team that is losing. Yes. That's yes. a given. Yes. That's a given. Yep. But the flip side of that coin is when you're losing this bad, this bad people have emotions around it. <laughs> yes. And emotions yep. around it yep. means you care. Yes. So as long as people are still mad about us, about our underperformance, mm. I believe we can get to a point where we can convert them mm. because they still care. Mm. If we were at this record and nobody was complaining, mm. it was just... Trip, 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 mm. You know, and there's nothing, no matter what we put out into the digital universe, mm. nobody cares about. Mm. That means our business is dead. Mm. If we put out something there and people are like, I expect better. Mm. Why are you on five? I hate this. I'm canceling my tickets. I'm mad. Awesome. Mm. It means you still care. Yes. And my job is to bring you back. Yes. You said something in an interview that I really liked, is, and the person said, hey, look, what do you say to the fan that says, hey, things are messed up here. When are we going to get kind of the old traditional uh, vibe that we used to have? And you said, well, I'm going to ask them a simple question and say, you know, where did I go wrong and, and how can we improve? You talked a lot about Ottawa's team and the, and the fact that you really liked what they were doing for their marketing. And you said, look, these guys seem to hit this under 30 uh, demographic really, really well. Now, would you say coming off of COVID into, you started uh, this position January 2022, correct? Mm. Would you say that you, I mean, you walked into a, into a, into a bomb in, in some senses, but getting people back in the seats that were now, you know, at home watching the game, have you found it's been difficult or do you think that maybe the digital landscape will give you more tools to get that goal or I guess get them back here? Well, the world of sports has changed, mm. COVID aside, which dramatically um, sped up changes. But the world has changed in that when I grew up and I wanted to come to an Eskimo game, mm. well, they were not on TV. Mm. It was blacked out. There was mm. a blackout. So mm. you had to come mm. to the stadium. Mm. And we only had the Oilers in this, mm. you know. Mm. But now <laughs> yeah. you've got Netflix, YouTube, yeah. a $100 flight to Las Vegas yeah, 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 that yeah. your family can yeah. do, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we have... <laughs> We have basketball, we have baseball, we have all these things that are competing for the fans' wallet. Mm. So the landscape in our city has changed. Mm. Globally, the landscape for sports has also changed in that people now can make get their sport fix, mm. not just from sitting down by for three hours. Mm. A lot of people, in fact, you know, data indicates that a lot of the younger generation are very content to engage in sports mm. with highlights mm. from YouTube, mm. highlights from Instagram, from mm. the stories or from Twitter. Mm. And that's, that's it. That's mm. all they need. They need the clips, blah, blah, blah. They're not sitting down for three hours. Mm. So if the world is changing, mm. how does our business change? Mm. The people coming into the stadium is still important. Mm. But, you know, you, you, you mentioned about Ottawa and under 30. Mm. That is one demographic. Sure. But the fact is, the typical sport fan mm. tends to be more mature. Yes. It, they tend yep. to be in their mid-40s and mm. older. And disposable income. And a little more disposable income. Ever, your course. family's a little yep. bit older, yep. right? You've yep. gone through the chaos yep. of yeah. your teens, yeah. and now you're like, oh, let me go back to sports. <laughs> I'm not there yet, Victor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm coming into that. <laughs> but exactly, yes. <laughs> exactly, right? So... Yes, that under 30 demographic is important. Yeah. But that it doesn't mean that our older demographic is not important. They mm. are massively important mm. because of their disposable income, mm. because they've got a lifetime of passion mm. around the sport. Mm. So they're, they're also an important fan base. I, I think that's amazing. So would you say that the Elks administration, so everybody, you know, you and everybody that's running this from the, the back end, uh, behind the scenes, so to speak, are you, are you living in the future? Do you see any of the mentality where it's like, okay, guys, you know, maybe we're in the past a little bit. What would you say is the, the mentality of the organization as a whole? You need a balance of both. Mm. I mean, what is unique about this team? Mm. What makes this team so different than everybody else? Like, and, and really one of the only reasons why I care to be a part of it mm. is we are a community-owned team, mm. which means 
we're run by a board of directors that are volunteers, that are community yes. leaders, and we are a registered not-for-profit. Mm. Our part of our DNA is to make our community better, mm. is to give back to the community, to go mm. out there and be active and visit schools. And our players have to believe in that mission as a community-owned team. Mm. And our leadership has to believe in that mission of what's important to us. And they do. Mm. Now, there are other sport teams that if all you have to do is make a profit, they don't care about any of those community initiatives. Mm. It's not important to them. Mm. It's how do we sell? How do we make money? Mm. We are very unique in the world of sports mm. in being community owned or not for profit. Now that governs our mm. our philosophy and our mindset of the things that we want to accomplish. Mm. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be a profitable business. Of mm. course you need to be profitable mm. to survive. Yes. Right? There's still the, the the facts of business and business economics. Yes. But how you choose to spend your money, how you choose to spend your resources, how you choose to spend your time mm. as an organization is very different. Huge, huge. You like to read books, right? You're a book reader, and you say you only read biographies. What, what, are, what are your top two biographies that you think really really move the, the needle forward for you if you are to pick two? Well, I think um, Phil Knight's Shoe Dog is, is, is really good. Good. Um, that one is a testament to a man's vision and bravery that's just different. Like, Oof. as his business grew every day, every day he was still on the verge of bankruptcy mm. because he didn't... He chose specifically mm. not to take his profits and save a little bit like mm. a normal person would. They're like, mm. oh, let's save 25% for a rainy day. He's like, <laughs> no, every dollar goes back into growth. Mm. Growth, growth, growth. And for a decade or decades and a half, that's what he did. Mm. You know, to the dismay of his financial advisors and stress of everybody around him. Mm. But he had a vision and mm. the bravery to execute that in a different way. And that was a big part of his success. I love that because it's something that, I don't think that I would be able to do. Mm. You know, if you get a million dollars in, do you spend a million dollars right away? Mm. Well, he did. Mm. You know, Huge. common sense would be, well, let me save 10% of this yes. or something, right? Yes. So I, I love that book. I love Tim Ferriss's uh, Tribe of Mentors, Ooh. you know, just because that's like a Coles Notes of yes. of biographies yes. of, of, of everything that he's done. Yes. Um, uh, but my... My go-to biographies, which is one of my first ones that my captain in the Navy, when I yes. served in the reserves, he put me on. And mm. um, that was on Sir Winston Churchill mm. and reading his biography about leadership and just how he dealt with the adversity when his own political party and mm. the nation is against him. Mm. But he had a belief and a fortitude that we have to win this war. Mm. We have mm. this person, mm. the the Nazi regime and Hitler is not what the world needs. Yes, and he was steadfast in that belief. While people were were saying, "Let's negotiate a peace. Mm. Let's 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 end this. Let's negotiate some sort of terms of of surrender mm. with 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 Germany." Mm. He was the one who stood up and said, "No." Mm. Right now, I, whenever you're in life and. The whole world is against you and your inner circle is Ooh. against you. Mm. It takes a different type Ooh. of person, yes. a leader, to, to, to continue on that path. And mm. so I look at that as a book of inspiration, of resilience, determination, mm. grit. and Because quite often on this entrepreneur journey, you see things and you Ooh. connect dots that Ooh. other people don't see. Yes. And yes. if you're not articulate enough to explain that picture that you see of the dots that you connected, you leave some people behind because mm. they don't understand it mm. and you move forward. So, you know, it, it is a, it can be a lonely space. Mm. Right? We had Greg Hoffman, which is the former CMO of Nike. He's the, he's mm. the person behind the Colin Kaepernick yeah. Uh, yeah. campaign on the show. And he said and one of Nike's uh, reasons for their success was they always do a great job of going to a, a crazy place first, making it safe, then asking their customers, their fans and their audience to join them. How is the Elks saying, hey, we're going to go into some innovation. We might even go into some future. We're going to carve out a really nice, cozy space for our fans. And then we're going to, nice in the way that they like to be communicated with, extend that invitation for them to come back. What are, what are you doing to, to really go there and extend that invitation back? The, there's not a one ubiquitous sort of solution to that mm. because the fan base that we have in Edmonton is very, very diverse, like mm. our community is. Yes, huge. And so... 
each pe- person has a different reason for their connection to sports. Mm. Sometimes it's family, an affordable night out. Mm. Other people are ex-players mm. that have a connection to it. Mm. And some people are just diehard fans because their great-grandfather brought them to a mm. game. So each one is a different value proposition. Mm. And, um, you know, I believe that sports mm. has made a massive shift and but business is not quite caught up yet. I mean, mm. What is this massive shift? I believe that sports is now a demographic of one. Ooh. Mm. So you would typically talk about, like you're saying, sure. what's your target demo? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it the age group here? Yeah, is yeah. it this income? Is yeah. it family? Whatever, yeah. whatever. But I think those are two broad buckets yes. that applied in different technology. Yes. Today, we have a dem- uh, demographic of one. Why? Mm. Because I can talk to you directly. Yes. I can talk to you directly on Instagram, yes. on Twitter, on yes. Facebook, on yes. Snapchat. Yes. And all each individual person that reaches out to me is important. Yes. So I can't do a blanket um, reach out or solution or value proposition Ooh. without losing credibility because they will know that it's wow. it's a blanket one. Wow, wow. So how the how do you scale? You know, telling story. You know, great marketing is storytelling. Essentially, how do we storytell to several different people but make it one? And you're very right about that. You hit the nail on the head. Have you found challenges doing that? Absolutely. So this flywheel of content mm. is one of the things that. One championship is phenomenal at. Yes. You know, when we when I started one championship, it was in a closet, <laughs> a small closet. <laughs> I didn't have a business card. We didn't have a website. We didn't know what to call the company. It's just like no staff. There was there was nothing. You know, and today the, it's a multi billion dollar business. Offices all around the world. Jeez. It's um, uh, you know, I don't know how how many athletes under a roster, but it's it's all across martial arts. And um, globally, it is, I think, the fourth most watched content in sports in the world. Wow. In the world wow. right now. And wow. that's because the, the organization has mastered a, a content flywheel. Mm. So I've been really fortunate to take from those great minds that I worked with and be able to apply that to what mm. we've got here. Mm. And so... It's not necessarily that every new content that you create is a 100% more new effort. Yes. You have to find a way that to create new content on this digital flywheel yes. is not exponential more resources and time, yes. but a derivative of what you've got. Yes. Now, that requires a strategy early on yes. of what are you doing for the entire year Yes. down to each day of yes. the type of content that yes. you want to create. Yes. Right? It's a very macro down to the micro vision of content creation. People would think, well, you just need to make stuff that's viral or you need to just like, <laughs> well, if you could, if yeah. you knew what that was, yeah, yeah. we'd all be billionaires. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So it, it is a bit day by day, yep. trying to understand what the trends are, what you want to ride on, but also consciously creating content and having everybody in the organization understanding how are we filming something yep. that is applicable on multiple platforms. Yes. So let's rewind, I don't know, five years ago. Sure. A typical organization would take this podcast and take this exact same content and put it on all of their digital yes. platforms yep. without any deviations. Yep. They wouldn't yeah. even change the, the caption, nothing. Yeah, yeah. forget the copy, horizontal no. to vertical, yeah, no, no, no. none of that. Yeah. They, would, they would just be like, oh, there you go. Uh, I call it the spray and pray method. That's right. Yeah. Like, Let's oh, see if it sticks. Look, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. social. I'm active <laughs> on social. <laughs> yeah. But that's not it. Yeah. Because who engages on Twitter engages it in a very different way. 100%. Right? 100%. Than, than Instagram, than yes. Snap, Yes. Well, you know, we like to say create once, distribute forever, but it's kind of interesting. Even the word create, create content, I tell people a lot of the time, I think that's sometimes where people go wrong is they're so focused on creating where I say, you know, it is kind of, and I think Gary Vee says it right. He says document, but you have such a great thing going on just on a day-to-day basis. Showcasing people just that is the content. And some people say, hey, what about this niche thing? I'm like, well, Victor is the content. You just showing up as, as yourself is the content. What made you? So you go, you start in Castle Downs. You go live in Asia 17 uh, years or so. You start this MMA uh, outfit up. And man, I, like, I'm, I'm scared of you too, Victor, because I know you're a black belt in Taekwondo. So I'm like, I ain't messing with you. I, I know you got that down pat. I, and you're so nice. You always got to worry about the nice people. They're, <laughs> the nice people. I'm like, yo, you better be extra nice to that person. <laughs> no, I, I, you don't have anything to fear from me. I think uh, 
my taekwondo skills in the fight are about as useful as salsa <laughs> dancing, you know. So, but uh, it's my wife you got to be scared of. Cause oh, she's, she's she's a martial artist oh. and she's tougher, ten times tougher. Oh, than me. I I agree with that. What do you so? How do you go from okay, we have this MMA outfit all the way into uh, president CEO of a CFL team? And by the way, when we look around the league in terms of diversity, especially at the president CEO level. Come on, man, Filipino guy. Like, how the hell does Victor muster this? Like, how do you do this? This I'm, is incredible. You're like a renaissance oh, man. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm blessed. I, I, I've had great people around me that have, have, have guided the way. Unpack that, um, though, because what about all the other, you know, Victor Quees and, and Ryan Holtzes and Filipinos and, you know, black folks and East Indian, like all, the, all, our, all our, you know, multiculturalism. How do we get into this position? Well, when, I was, a kid, when I was a kid and I looked at being in the world of sports, mm. being a part of this organization was an impossibility to me. Mm. It was behind a secret black curtain run by the elite of Edmonton. Yeah. And I had no access to that. That's not the social circles that my parents rolled in, mm. you know, and, and that wasn't, I didn't even begin. And there was nobody even in the world of sports that I could look to that looked like me for me to understand. Mm. And it's, it's weird how that has affected my psyche because... Growing up, I never even knew that there was not visible minorities mm. in movies or on mm. television. Mm. I, I, I just didn't, it never, it never hit me, mm. right? But today you watch Spider-Man, and I mean, I watched, uh, I don't remember what, what movie it was, but uh, I'm one of the recent Marvel movies, and there was like no Caucasian people in it. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. You know? yeah, you're like, wait a sec. And, 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 then, and then now that struck me as weird. I was like, yeah. what? Yeah. what? Like Hollywood has really gone to the yeah. other, other side of it. Yeah. So, But I take to the world of sports and I couldn't see anybody that was, that was like me. But very early on in my life, mm. and it was one of my first captains in the Navy that drilled this into me. Mm. Because I would talk to him, I'm like, I want to make money. I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want to make money. Mm -hmm. Make money, you know. Hustle, hustle, and, yeah. And, and that was my mindset. And he said, Don't chase money. Mm. Chase knowledge. Ooh. And if you chase knowledge, it will give you the money. Mm. And I did. I didn't quite understand it. Yes. But it always stuck with me for yes. a, for a while. And I realized as I got into jobs. Mm. I stopped asking people what my salary was going to be. Mm. I just wanted to know. Is this the person that I can learn from? Ooh. Now, if you were not a boss, I was. If you were too insecure as a boss, Ooh. you would not share your knowledge, mm. right? Ooh. You'd be, you'd be, you'd feel threatened by everybody mm. around you. But if you're a confident boss and secure in yourself, you want to spread knowledge. You want to rise people up because you know the faster you pick people up, the faster you got to mm. grow, right? Yes. So I started looking at a different lens with mm. with, with opportunities that I was pursuing. It's mm. like what am I going to take here that's going to be valuable for me? Mm. And I was very fortunate that that path led to other opportunities and opened up things that, you know, help, helped. Do you think your mind was calibrated to, to realize that not every opportunity is attached to a paycheck? It just in your DNA or is it your upbringing through your parents? Like, how did your mind be calibrated that way? Because not every, like, I mean, a lot of, most people's minds are not calibrated. They're all about... Well, what's, you know, it's the shiny object syndrome. Like, what's in it for me now? They're not thinking, you know, three, five, ten years down the road. Mm -hmm. How did you just come out and say, look, I, like, I understand. If I connect myself to that person, hey, this could be a great opportunity. Don't really care what you pay me. I think part of it, too, was I was, I was lucky. And this is where mm. luck does play a fortune, uh, you know, a factor. Mm. Where I had bosses that gave me that knowledge mm. and let me see what you could do. Behind the curtain. You know? Mm. And uh, I'll, I'll give you an example former president CEO from here who was the president CEO for the Edmonton 2001 World Championships, mm. a man called Rick Lullisher oh, yeah, and yeah, Joan yeah. Forge. Yep, yep. You know, I was working for them in, in, uh, in 1999 and they said, I think you should do, I was working more on the events and the marketing side. And they're like, yes. we need somebody to do PR and communications ah. and work with the media. I'm like, well, I don't know anything about <laughs> that. And they're like, Learn. Yeah. Then learn. Wow. Go figure out and do it. Yeah. We need somebody. I believe in you. Wow. And, and having a boss that just says, okay, mm. you might not know it, but I believe that you have the ability to learn. Mm. It filled me with a kind of confidence. I'm like, okay, I might not know everything today, and that's good. At least mm. I know that I don't know. Mm. But I know that I can learn faster than the average person. Mm. And that's just what I tried to do. I tried to set my learning curve like this. Mm. I don't always 
succeed in that. Sometimes yeah, yeah. the learning curve drops the other way. Yeah. You know, but I think that's what you want to pursue. Mm. How important is failure for you? I fail massively every day. Mm. I, I, I make mistakes every day, mm. all the time. And um, this is, I think, something that my, my parents really gave me the opportunity to learn in that, you know, quite young, I would take apart things. Mm. I take apart the lawnmower, bicycles, mm. the mm. telephones. Mm. And there's always this fear when you start to take apart something mm. that what if you break it? Ooh. Yes. And you can't put it back together. Mm. What if it's a waste of money? All mm. these risks. But as you take it apart and you 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 look at pieces, you realize actually somebody put it together. Yes. So there is a logic to it. There is a possibility that you would fail. Interesting. But there's also a possibility that you can bring it back together in a different way. Yes. Right? And, and that fear of being dumb yes. does not fill me with fear anymore yes so i like to be in situations where i feel stupid yes it means i'm gonna have an opportunity yes, to learn yes yes a lot of people in life try to avoid feeling stupid mm. because it's scary mm. you know mm. it's you know that feeling when you go to first time to a, a new city and you don't know anything yeah that, yeah that feeling yeah that's the feeling that i look for yes. every time yes. so i get the chance to meet you i'm yeah. like well i don't know anything about you i don't yeah. know anything about your business about yeah. your life what can i learn yes. what can i walk away with from here yeah well i know you're on a quest to find all the filipino food yeah. across <laughs> canada on the on the road too yeah, right yeah <laughs> which is great and, and it's funny too because i know your Canada you posted instagram you you built a you did a football uh field in the back of your house there i yeah. see you spray painting the, <laughs> the numbers and everything so are you a are you a mechanically inclined person like if i give you a set of tools are you pretty handy or are are you gonna break no, your house down? No, no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> handy, handy like that. Like I, yeah. there's a lot. I know friends that are way more handy. Yeah, than yeah, me, yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife would definitely say I'm not handy. <laughs> Call but, somebody. Yeah, yeah. But I like to take things apart. Interesting. Yeah, I like to, and I like to understand the workings of it. And and this is a a, a weird job, you know. Yes. Like, See, so, so I've been on the job. I don't know, 19 months or whatever it yes. is. Yes. And it is a role where every single day. Mm. Someone has crapped on me Ooh, every single yes, day. Yes, yes. And I knew that this was the organization we're coming into. I knew there was a lot yes, of work that we need to do. Yes. And I was willing to, to embrace that. And it's the challenge of trying to fix the organization and make us better that, mm. that excites me. Mm. You know, it's difficult to deal with the criticism and the crap on you and all this mm. kind of stuff. I can handle that. Mm. It's, it's not. Does it's a problem when it goes to my wife and my children? Mm. That's a different level. Of course, course. And some, unfortunately, but, some fans mm -hmm, take it that mm -hmm, take it to mm -hmm. that next level. Yeah. And that's just the world that we're in today. Offside, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. You know, but that's, that's life. My son had a question for you, and he said, "I want you to ask Victor, uh, where does he get the courage to run a team and put your neck out and get it chopped off a few times and take the heat?" And I'm looking at you. Barely have any gray hair, man. Maybe it's the Filipino genes. I don't know. You got the Chinese roots, but. Uh, how the hell do you deal with the criticism? I mean, this is a, that's a tough thing to do. Many people will, you know, just run under a chair and say, I don't want to do this anymore. Like you hurt my feelings. How do you kind of, I guess, I guess, how do you, how do you place your ego to the side and value your goals more than your actual feelings? Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, ego is important, mm. right? You have to have some ego to believe in yourself to succeed on a path that nobody else is down. Mm. I won't say that I'm devoid of ego, mm. but on the flip side, I've also learned that ego has been the greatest failure for many, many <laughs> businesses. Mm. And if you don't figure out how to gain objectivity as much as you can, no one can be perfect. Of course. Objective. Yeah. We're emotional creatures. Yeah. yeah. By putting your ego aside, it will lead to your demise. Mm. It will lead to failure. Do I take criticism? Does it still sting? Mm. Of course it stings. Of course. And it stings because I care. Mm. The stuff that criticizes stuff that I doesn't sting is because I don't care about that. Got it. Oh, you want to criticize your uh, Toyota Corolla? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't care. Don't I'm don't not care. invested in Toyota Corolla. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 it stings because I care about it. But I welcome it because... Mm. This is the world of sports, and the great thing about sports is mm. everyone has an opinion on it. Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. is an armchair quarterback, mm -hmm. and they want to tell yes. you, and it's locker room conversation, yes. and that's great. Yes. It's, unfortunately, the bad side of it, too, that mm. everyone has an opinion on your business, mm. you know? I can mm. imagine people are going up to F1 driver Lewis Hamilton and being oh. like, I've driven a car for 40 years of my life. Mm. Let me tell you how to take this corner. Yes. You know? yeah. So 
everyone's dealing with that in sports. Well, and I love what you said too, because you said in one of the interviews there, you said, look, I've lived in countries where you weren't allowed to have an opinion. You weren't allowed to, you know, have uh, more than a party of three. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, the fact that you actually get an opinion is a beautiful thing to live in a country that way. So most people get very, um, I guess, romanticized about their own opinion. For me, I, I kind of, I, I want people to disagree with me. And I think it's very dangerous to have only yes people around you. Mm -hmm. If everybody in your meeting is saying yes, 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 that yeah. to me is a red flag because you want people to push back and say, ah, actually, yeah, you know, this is my perspective on this, mm -hmm. right? How important is it, I guess, to to cultivate a team? But when for you walking into an existing, you know, kind of an administration, so to speak, how do you get that buy-in, especially from the leadership standpoint? Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. Mm. Whenever the new leader comes in and is inheriting inheriting an entire organization, mm. there's learning what the culture is, making mm. the changes at the right pace. You know, you can't do too much that destroys the organization and you have to have this balance of history and where you want to go mm. and all that kind of stuff. But where we're very fortunate in this organization is the team and our board recognizes we need to change. Mm. We'd like, everyone, mm. everyone can mm. see change has to happen. Yeah, yeah. Now, the pace of change yes. is up for debate. Yes. But everyone's open to it. Yes. So that's the starting part. Yes, I love that. Uh, I got to get you going here. I know you got to a, a hard stomp, but uh, I guess the last question I really want to ask you is, what is your overall, I mean, man, you, you, you're, I think about, sometimes I look in people's eyes and I'm like, could you imagine you could like get a USB cable and plug it into like somewhere on your body and like download what you've seen over the course? If somebody was to download Victor Quee's USB hard drive in his brain, what would they see? How could you sum that up? Who the hell are you? What is kind of your biggest piece of advice as you've kind of walked into MMA all the way into Asia, coming back? What is just one, I guess, advice bomb you could drop on our audience? Oh. Anything you want. Football related, none. I don't care. Just anything where you're like, no, nope, I kind of live by this. <clears throat> I think there's two things that I would I'd bring up there. The first one is ranking and priority health, family, and work. Mm. Now, when you're a driven human like yourself, mm. it's very easy for work to consume yes. all of you. Yes. And I'm guilty of that. You mm. know, with one championship in the first nine years, I spent four years 100% away from my family. Wow, yeah. Like, it didn't feel like that during the nine of years. Of course. But as I looked back at that period, of course. that's what it was. It was four years 100% away from my family, on the road, building the business, and it was a massive sacrifice. Mm. And my life was not in balance. Mm. My health suffered. I didn't get to work out as, as much as mm. I want. So health was, was poor. Mm. Family was getting weakened. But work was really successful. Mm. So you have to make these sacrifices. Mm. And now, if you look at the, the, the timeline that you want to do, right? Is it five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? You mm. can allow yourself periods where certain, those those priorities get changed mm. it can be in this period while your children is young mm. and where they don't know that you're absent mm -hmm. that you can make work a higher priority yes and maybe you work out less yes you know, and that, that yes but health family and work is the priority that i'm trying to strive to to mm. keep that in balance i don't always do it but it's that's the checklist in my mind. Well, we, we call that the soulful currency account here in Team Holtzland because we say, look, you got your vibe currency. Like when you meet somebody, right? A lot of people you meet walk around society, they're not even awake. Like, I, like sometimes people I'm like, are you awake? Like, are you present? Are you, they're just existing. They're not really living. And so for our soulful currency account, we always say we got vibe currency, monetary currency, health currency, family currency, and then mental and physical hygiene currency. Love it. And I feel like if you deposit, do daily deposits into the soulful currency account, I think everything will square away in the end for you if you're conscious about that as you're going. Uh, last question, Victor, is uh, I asked all my guests, what the hell can I do for you? And thank you for having us uh, in your home. This is incredible. What can I do for you? Well, thank you for coming here. Mm. I think that's the first big part of it. Um, you can make this podcast blow up to 10 billion people. That would be good. Done. We do that. Done. Um, but I think it's step by step, you know? When I talk about this um, demographic of one. Mm. You are one, mm. right? And, and I, um, we need to go back to community leaders like yourself mm. and engage and spend the time yes. like this one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. Because what you bring to our community is important. Huge. And what we do as a community organization is important to support you. Mm. So this collaboration is, 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 is critical to me. And I don't care if somebody has a podcast with 100 listeners mm. or 1 million listeners, mm. if you're a leader in this community and want to build something, 
Mm. I want our team to be able to support you and be a part of it. Oof. And so, and, and um, that is, you know, like I mentioned at, at the beginning, part of our philosophy of, mm. of, of the organization, but also what I'm on a mission to. I know how hard it is to be an entrepreneur. Mm. I know that pain. Oof. I know what it's like to be broke. Mm. I know what it's like to put all of your dreams into mm. something and you want it to succeed. Mm. So if I can help other businesses on that journey and maybe avoid some of the mistakes that I did, yes. that's great. Yes. Now that means bringing them here and spreading the word of like, okay, we're open for business. Yes, Come talk to us. What do you need? Oh, you need you need time as a podcast. Oh, you need time as a as an interview, as a yes. radio, or whatever yes. it might be. Huge. All of that is is um is critical. I love that, uh, Victor Kui, man. You you are a Renaissance man. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. The only thing I need you to say is if you can just say uh, hi. My name is Victor Kui, President and CEO of Edmonton Elks, and I was just on the Ryan Old Show. Hi, my name is Victor Kui, President of. Uh well, let me start that oh, again. Oh, go ahead again. Yes, I'll take Let's go. Of what? <laughs> say Eskimos. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, oh, <laughs> blooper. Yeah, yeah. My name is Victor Kui, uh, President and CEO. No, of say it again. Else. Say it again. No, no, say it again. I, I need some loud and proud here. <laughs> This is Victor Kui, President and CEO, Edmonton Elks, and I was just on the Reinhold Show. I love that. Victor, thank you so much. We're so glad you enjoyed this episode of the Reinhold Show podcast. Please don't forget to smash that five-star review as team hosts will love you for it. Also, say hi to Ryan anywhere on social media using the handle at RyanHoltz1. That's R-Y-A-N-H-O-L-T-Z, the number one. And if you or your business is looking to expand your brand, book a brand jam with Ryan using the link in the show notes.